I always take my son to the Vanessa Buchanan. Hi, I am Christy and this is Sarah and we're going to be talking about high blood pressure, also known as hypertension. Thank you for coming and thanks to those of you who are tuning in. So what we're going to talk about is an overview of blood pressure, factors that affect blood pressure, effects of exercise, and effects of diet on blood pressure. So Sarah's right. going to start out with an overview. Excellent. Thank you, Christy. Welcome, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. Um, before I get started, just know that there will be no test on this material, and I'm going to cover some uh, more scientific terms, and if there's anything you have questions about, I encourage you to make a note and ask at the end for our question and answer portion. Um, so blood pressure is cardiac output times peripheral resistance. Peripheral uh, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So in simpler terms, stroke volume is the amount of blood that's coming out of the heart for each contraction, and the heart rate is how many times it's contracting per minute. Peripheral resistance is affected by three main factors. Blood vessel diameter, so how big or small the blood vessels are, which is directly affected by exercise, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, blood viscosity uh, and or volume, and that's directly affected by diet, which Christy will share with us about in just a bit, and total vessel length, which I'm gonna to touch on briefly right now. And that's just, if you can imagine a big long tube, the longer the tube is, the more pressure it takes to get the fluid all the way to the end of the tube, which creates more pressure in the system overall. And this relates to weight directly by um, that per pound of extra body weight added, you appro add approximately a mile's worth of vascular system. And so that's quite a bit. And that is why a modest decrease in body weight, such as 10%, can really help mitigate the effects of hypertension. All right, so these are the standard values. Um, they just got updated, and I've heard a lot of comments about it from my client. Um, Despite common opinion, it is not to sell more hypertensive medications. It's actually so that we can identify individuals who may be dealing with hypertension sooner because we know that the sooner we get them on treatment and help them with the lifestyle factors, the better off they're gonna be long-term. And early hypertension is a direct correlative factor to early death. So that's why they lowered the rates of nor, um, stage one hypertension. So systolic blood pressure, which is the maximum when your heart contracts and the maximum pressure, optimal range is 120. And then diastolic pressure is your minimum or when the heart is completely relaxed, that's the amount of pressure in your vascular system. And that's 80. So in the normal range, 120 to 120 to 129 and 80 to 84. Uh, high normal, 130 to 139, I see this one a lot, actually, and 85 to 89. And this is a great place to add in lifestyle factors before we get all the way down here into the higher levels of hypertension. Hi, welcome, come on in. I'm glad you guys made it. I was just saying how they lowered the hypertension levels, not to sell more medication, but so that we can identify individuals sooner so that we can help them with lifestyle factors and treatment. All right, next. So the prevalence of hypertension, this is from the CDC. Here we have everybody, and then they break it down into men and women. We'll kind of just focus on everybody for this presentation. 
we have the 18 and over, so the average, which is about a third. And then we have the 18 to 39. We have the 40 to 59. And then we have over 60. So over 60, two thirds of everybody has hypertension. The main reason for that is that as we age, the, mus the muscle lining of your blood vessels loses its ability to expand and contract. Um, and so that increases your blood pressure overall. Now, one thing I want to point out about the 18 to 39 group is that even though this is a small number, because this is such a, uh, this is such a strong predictor of early death, if you're in this category, you're very likely to not make it to this category. And so if you're in this category, we want to address it as soon as possible. So just because it's a small number does not mean it's a good number. And next slide. All right. So high blood pressure in the United States. What do you think of when you think of hypertension? What kind of diseases? Obesity. Stroke, obesity. Heart attack. Heart attack. Yeah. So heart disease and stroke are the leading cause of death. And having high blood pressure says, oh, it puts you at risk. Well, it puts you at a very high risk of basically what kills most people. So about 75 million Americans, which is one third, have hypertension. And the interesting thing, these two go together. So one third of adults have hypertension in America. And one third are prehypertensive. So even if you're not over 60, two thirds of the people you know are dealing with some level of hypertension. Big problem. About half of the people who have diagnosed hypertension do not have it under control. Also a big problem. And then um, I'm just gonna read this one because I thought it was so interesting. High blood pressure was a primary or contributing cause of death for more than 410,000 Americans in 2014. That's 1,100 1, deaths each day related to hypertension. I think that this is a great highlight of when we have an issue that just gets talked about a lot, it becomes normalized. Like, oh, hypertension. Everybody has hypertension, it's not a big deal. But it is a huge deal, and um, I just wanted to point that out. And then this is the cost of hypertension in the US, which is $48.6 billion a year is the healthcare cost. It includes um, healthcare services, medications, and days of missed work related to hypertension. All right, next slide. So the dangers of hypertension, we're already all pretty aware of stroke and heart attack as far as um, hypertension goes. But I wanted to go into what's happening in the blood vessels a little bit more. One thing we, the atherosclerosis is based on the pressure causing microscopic damage to the endothelial lining, which is the skin on the inside of your blood vessels. And so when that damage happens from all of that pressure, the body is plastering it with plaque and then starts calcifying it in an effort to combat that damage to keep it from breaking open. And then we end up with occlusions or blocks in our arteries, which is um, main cause of stroke. And the other thing that happens is that in your blood vessels, you have this circular muscle lining and that muscle lining is what governs the the getting bigger and smaller, <laughs> very technical terms here, of your blood vessels. And when the pressure is really high, that muscle lining gets thicker. Not much different than when you do exercise to resistance training to make your arm muscles get bigger. It gets bigger to combat all that pressure, but when it gets bigger, it loses its ability to function as well. And so that's a really big problem. And the same thing happens in the heart. So what we see in the heart with chronic high blood pressure is left ventricle hypertrophy or thickening of the wall of the left ventricle of the heart. That's the side of the heart that pushes blood into the system, what we call the systematic circuit, right? And so it's pushing against all that pressure and it has to get thicker in order to be able to push past it. And one of the things that happens is that there isn't as much room for blood and so therefore cardiac output goes down because the heart can't move as much blood because the chamber of the heart is smaller due to the thickening. It also loses its capacity to function in the same manner. So, and then kidneys and the eyes are very soft tissues. They are very susceptible to pressure changes in the body. 
the eye is mostly water. And so fluid pressure changes in the body really affect the eyes and the kidneys. And one thing that's happening is that these delicate tissues have these really specific cellular units that are functioning to create our vision and for our urine output. And that pressure damages them. And then the body tries to heal itself. And in its process of healing itself, it creates scar tissue. And that scar tissue takes away that tissue's capacity to function the way it's supposed to and then greatly decreases. And then this goes over a long period of time. Once there's more scar tissue than there is healthy tissue, you're no longer able to create urine like you need to. Your eyesight goes, and that's a huge problem. And then with strokes, there's the you know, thrombotic, thromb I didn't say that right, thrombosis, blood clots, which can occlude or block off the blood flow to parts of the brain. But there's also the aneurysm strokes, where you actually blow a blood vessel in your brain. And I like to think about the fact that it's not, it's not like a passive feeling. It's not like, oh, it blows open and blood pours into this big cavity. Like, there's no space. And that blood is under a huge amount of pressure. And so what it does is it's like punching that brain tissue that's right there really hard. And so it's damaging. Just the moment it bursts open, it's damaging all that tissue, um, even if it has the capacity to, to clot itself and to stop bleeding. That damage has already been done because it's like a blunt force trauma to the brain. So, and obviously we want to avoid all of this. That's my side. So how does this relate to exercise? All right, so the American College of Sports Medicine, which is the governing body that certifies, hopefully me, here in about six months, as a certified exercise physiologist, um, put out a position stance on exercise and hypertension. For those of you who don't know, a position stance is when the governing body, such as the A and D or the ACSM, um, looks at the entirety of the body of data that's available, the research that's been done, and everything that we know about a subject, and then they, they condense it all down into what they call evidence statements. And these evidence statements are kind of like the gold standard of uh, stuff we can follow. So the evidence statement on aerobic exercise is dynamic aerobic training reduces resting blood pressure in individuals with normal blood pressure and those with hypertension. Evidence category A. And what evidence category A means is that this has been shown and this effect has been seen in clinical controlled experimental trials in different locations over a long period of time. And we can take that information and we can apply it to a population. Right? And we're really likely to see a similar result throughout the population. That's, so, that's what this means. And they said something really interesting, which was that individuals who need it most will benefit most from exercise. So the higher your hypertension is, the higher your numbers are, the more uh, numbers you're going to see drop when you mitigate it with lifestyle, especially aerobic exercise, which is just super, super cool because all that scary stuff that we don't want to happen to us or our loved ones is something that we can we can do something about this in our real everyday life okay so how does exercise lower blood pressure there are quite a few ways that it does it but this is the big one it's the the math daddy of how it lowers, lowers blood pressure and that's exercise induced nitric oxide production this is the smooth muscle lining of your blood vessels and when you start exercising it, your heart rate goes up, right? Because we already learned that it's cardiac output times heart rate. So that heart rate goes up. It stimulates your nervous system to go, oh, my blood pressure is spiking because I'm exercising. We need to open up the blood vessels. And so the smooth muscle tissue releases nitric oxide and all your blood vessels vasodilate when you're exercising. But this creates, so that's an acute, so an immediate response to an immediate action that creates, go ahead and switch the slide, a condition that we call post-exercise hypotension. And what this is, is that you're, the lowering of your blood pressure based on the vasodilation of your blood vessels lasts for up to 20 hours after you're done with exercise. So those benefits you get from the exercise stick with you all day, right? 
which is a really easy segue into, well, if I exercise every day, you mean I can lower my blood pressure every day? Yes, that is the big takeaway from all of this, is that you can manage your hypertension with exercise. Now this gentleman is a client of mine, gave me permission to use this data, uh, 64 year old sedentary male diagnosed with chronic hypertension. He's on beta blockers and diuretics, which is a really common combination. Uh, I know he's sedentary because even though he was active, he was not working out 30 minutes a day, three times a week for more than three months in general. So had he been working out that much for one month, he still wouldn't have had the physiological adaptations from exercise. So this is one of our first sessions. It wasn't the very first one, but it was really close. His exercise prescription was moderate intensity exercise, 40 to 60% of his age predicted heart rate max 30, for 30 minutes, four plus days a week, right? And so he came in, I had him sit down in a chair legs uncrossed and rest for five minutes so that he was rested. So this is with his medication and being in a rested, relaxed state, his blood pressure was still in the high range and his systolic blood pressure in particular was high. Warmed him up, put him through 20 minutes of cardio, cooled him down and it dropped his, and then I rested him again in that chair for five minutes so I recreated that situation, dropped his blood pressure all the way down into the healthy range. Super cool, 20 minutes. That's the amount of time he spent working. It was 30 minutes overall because of the warm up and cool down, but that's all it took. And I didn't have him running you know, at breakneck speed on a treadmill. He wasn't doing CrossFit or burpees. He was, so this 1.7 miles per hour is like, it's uncomfortably slow to walk on a treadmill at 1.7 miles an hour. And then 2.5 is just a little bit faster. It's brisk, right? And then we added about 5% grade, which isn't that much. And so he was working hard enough to get really warm, to beat up a little bit of sweat, and that was it. He could talk, he wasn't huffing and puffing, and he definitely wasn't in a whole bunch of pain. Uh, so, next slide. What I want you to really get out of all of this is that moderate intensity exercise can reduce blood pressure by up to 15 milligrams of mercury for up to 20 hours post-exercise. And when done on a daily basis, moderate intensity exercise can effectively <laughs> mitigate hypertension. All right, so switching gears a little bit, we're gonna talk about how you can use diet to moderate your blood pressure. So diet affects your blood volume. Like Sarah mentioned earlier, that's one of the factors that affects blood pressure. And how that works is the kidneys control the amount of fluid stored in your body they filter the blood and remove extra fluid, which is then excreted as urine. And we'll come back to that in a minute. So just a couple definitions. So salt is what most people think of when they think of sodium. So salt is actually sodium chloride. So it's 60% sodium, 40% chloride. And one teaspoon of salt contains about 2,300 milligrams of sodium. Um, how a high sodium diet affects your blood pressure is it raises the amount of sodium in your bloodstream the water follows the sodium, so you retain the water, and then that increases your blood volume, which then increases your blood pressure. So the average American consumes 3,400 milligrams of sodium per day, um, but the recommendations from 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans and Healthy People 2020 recommend less than 2,300 milligrams per day. So they did a survey, they asked people about how much sodium they thought they consumed in a day. And this red line here um, is 3,400 milligrams, so about what most people consume. But 97% of people either didn't know, which is this big bar here, or underestimated how much sodium they consumed, so they were to the left. And then these two tiny bars are the people who accurately guessed about how much sodium they were consuming. So most people really don't understand unless you're intentionally tracking it how much sodium you consume. So where are we getting all the sodium from? Um, most of it, 74%, this big blue section, is from processed foods. 15% is naturally occurring, so some foods just naturally have sodium. 5% um, is added at the table, which is this gray bar. This kind of yellowy one is from home cooking, and then they just had a catch-all of other, which was less than 1%. 
So since processed foods are the main source of sodium, I thought it was important to define that. So the FDA defines processed food as any food other than a raw agricultural commodity and includes any raw agricultural commodity that has been subject to processing, such as canning, cooking, freezing, dehydration, or milling. So why do they add salt? Um, a big reason is taste. So things that have salt in them tend to taste better, so people want to buy them. And it also prolongs the shelf life of the food by killing or slowing down the growth of organisms, which is another benefit if you're making a food product. The salty six are the like, top six sources of sodium. So we'll just go through each of these. Bread and rolls I thought was kind of surprising. I wouldn't really guess that would be a big source of sodium, but if you think about it, if you have a piece of toast with breakfast, a sandwich with lunch, which would be two pieces of bread, and then like a roll for dinner, you're essentially having four servings of bread, and it's not uncommon for bread to contain 200 milligrams of sodium, so you're getting 800 milligrams in a day. Um, pizza is similarly high, partly because of the crust, but it also has the sauce, which is usually pretty high in sodium, the cheese, which is generally high in sodium, and a lot of toppings like pepperoni, sausage, those sorts of things, also high in sodium. Sandwiches are a similar combination that aren't ideal. <laughs> so you've got the bread that we know it tends to be higher in sodium. Usually you put condiments like mayonnaise or mustard, then you put deli meat, cheese, it all adds up. Um, cold cuts and cured meats, so like bacon, deli meats, those tend to have a lot of sodium added to them. A lot of canned goods, like we mentioned before, are processed foods, so they also tend to have a lot of sodium. And then burritos are another one, kind of like sandwiches and pizza, that are just a combination of a lot of things that tend to be high in salt. So how do you decrease sodium? When you're shopping, you can read food labels, because oftentimes, even if there are like two different kinds of bread, if you look at the labels and they're from different producers, they'll have different amounts of sodium. So just really making sure to look and see how much you're purchasing in that food. You can also choose fresh meat over cured food, so like a shredded chicken that you make at home instead of purchasing bacon, ham, or deli meats. Also choosing fresh or frozen fruits and vegetables over canned. Like we talked about, canned foods tend to have a lot of sodium added, so choosing fresh, obviously those don't have salt added to them. And frozen fruits that don't have a sauce added tend to just be flash frozen as they are and don't have any sodium. Also avoiding pickled foods, obviously pickles, olives and sauerkraut, the brine that they're in is high in salt, so they become high in salt also. So when you're looking at labels, something else that you want to look for, there's a lot of terms related to sodium that I think can be kind of confusing. So if something is salt or sodium free, that means it has less than five milligrams of sodium, very low sodium, less than 35, low sodium, less than 140, and then the reduced sodium and light in sodium are comparing one product to a similar version of the same product. So reduced sodium means that it has at least 25% less than the original product, whereas light in sodium means it has at least 50% less than the original. And then no salt added or unsalted means they didn't add any salt, but it could still have that naturally occurring salt. I'm looking at a couple labels. Um, so if you were looking at the vegetable soup on the left versus the reduced sodium version on the right, um, you can see there's a pretty big difference. So for the same serving size, you're getting 28% of your daily sodium in the regular version and 14% in the reduced sodium. So that makes a big difference when you're shopping which one you want to choose. Another way to decrease sodium is when you're cooking. Um, you can add less salt than a recipe calls for. So if it calls for a teaspoon, you can add half a teaspoon, see how it tastes and adjust it. You can also flavor foods with seasonings other than salt. So there are a lot of really good salt-free seasoning blends, dried herbs or citrus juice are some ideas. Rinsing canned foods removes some of the salt on the outside. It'll still have some that got into the food, but rinsing them helps get rid of a little bit of the sodium that's in the canned foods. And then adding salt when you're sitting down to eat instead of during the recipe production um, can help really just salt to taste so you don't end up using as much overall. And finally, when you're eating out, some tips to decrease sodium are to avoid salty ingredients, so especially like bacon, pickles, olives, cheese that we talked about. Also, if you're looking at a menu and it says that it's pickled, cured, or smoked, it's another sign that it's probably pretty high in sodium. 
and then as hard as it is, <laughs> choosing fruit or vegetables as a side instead of chips or fries is another good tip. So some categories of things that you'll commonly come across in restaurants. Um, there are some that are high in sodium, medium sodium, and less sodium, just to be aware of. So high sodium is more than 300 milligrams, and I think a big one is a tablespoon of soy sauce at the bottom has 690 milligrams. Most people don't usually use just a tablespoon in my experience, so that adds up really fast. Similarly, the barbecue sauce, um, two tablespoons is 350 milligrams. Most people don't use two tablespoons, so just keeping an eye out for that and being aware. And a pickle um, provides a quarter of your daily sodium. So medium sodium, maybe some better options are 10 french fries, but again, that's something to keep an eye on the serving size because I think most people eat whatever comes with their sandwich, not necessarily counting out 10. Um, salad dressing is another one just to be aware of, and salsa as well. So the condiments are something to really keep an eye out for. Um, but some good options, Swiss cheese is just naturally lower in sodium. So if you do want cheese on like a burger or something, that's a good option. Um, and milk is uh, an example of they don't add salt to milk. Uh, it's just naturally occurring. So just to be aware that there is some sodium in that. So switching a little bit to potassium, um, potassium helps blunt the effects of sodium and relaxes your blood vessel walls. So the recommended potassium intake is 4,700 milligrams per day, but again, most Americans aren't consuming enough. And paired with excess sodium consumption, uh, more sodium is flushed out in the urine, but the potassium and calcium also follow. The body senses that there's lower potassium levels and wants to hold on to sodium the water follows the sodium and just kind of creates a vicious cycle of increasing your blood volume. So some good potassium sources, I think a lot of people are familiar with bananas, but also potatoes are a really good source. Um, dairy, another good source, beans, and a variety of fruits and vegetables. So a diet that's been developed to, well, the dietary approach to stop hypertension, the DASH diet, um, is recommended for people who have high blood pressure or to prevent progression to one of the higher stages Sarah mentioned earlier. So what it recommends is consuming a diet low in saturated fat, cholesterol, red meat, and sugar-sweetened beverages, while consuming a diet high in fruits, vegetables, dairy products, and whole grain foods, things that are rich in potassium, magnesium, calcium, protein, and fiber, and meeting the guideline of consuming less than 2,300 milligrams per day but ideally less than 1,500 milligrams per day of sodium. So this is just a nice little infographic that shows what they would recommend you eat on the DASH diet. So that would be six to eight servings of whole grains, four to five servings of vegetables, four to five servings of fruit, two to three servings of dairy, four to five servings of nut seeds and legumes, less than six servings per week of lean meat, poultry, or fish, less than five servings a week of week of sweets, and two to three servings a day of fats and oils. So now Sarah's going to talk, we're going to switch back to exercise and she's going to give you a fun demonstration. All right, awesome. You wouldn't believe bread, right? If, you, if I was to guess, I would never have guessed bread would have so much salt in it. Um, because I can't get you all up and run you around for 30 minutes and give you your resting and your post-exercise values to show what a profound difference it makes. Um, I'm just going to give you the basic exercise prescription for hypertension, and then I'm going to give you a demonstration on a, a passive exercise you can do. It's more of a flexibility um, that helps mitigate some of the issues caused by hypertension. So it's more of a treatment um, for, for side effects of hypertension. So the basic prescription is three to five days a week. Seven is better, of course, right? Get that benefit every day. Uh, 40 to 60% or very moderate intensity, uh, age predicted heart rate max. Um, this is just a little example, 220 minus age times 0 0.4, 0 0.6. I don't expect you to do any math, but you can also Google a calculator for this and just type in your information and get that number. Um, and you can just use the rate of perceived exertion. So 6 to 14, it's the Borg scale, which is 0 to 20, which I know is a little unfamiliar. We're used to everything being 1 to 10. But it's correlated to heart rate. 
And so if you imagine that zero is laying down, like you just woke up, but you're conscious, but you haven't moved at all, and 20 is you're collapsing, you're working so hard, that six, six is really light intensity exercise, and 14 is like you're, you're on the vigorous end of moderate intensity exercise. So you should still be, you should be not breathing too hard, you ought to be able to talk, but you're, you're moving, right? So 30 to 60 minutes a day accumulated in at least 10 minute bouts, and if you move around for 10 minutes at a time at a moderate pace, you're going to get the benefits of exercise. So if you don't have 30 minutes, but you have 10 minutes, um, do it. And often I hear people, you go, oh, I, I can't work out because I got to go to work and I have to take a shower and then I need all this stuff and then I got to go to the gym. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Bring a change of shoes if your work shoes don't work for walking. Change your shoes. Go for a 10 minute walk, turn around, come back. You don't need to shower. You didn't work that hard, <laughs> right? So, and then aerobic exercise with supplemental resistance training. Resistance training is slightly different. That would be a great question for our question and answer portion. Like, how does resistance training affect? But we really want to focus on the aerobic exercise for the post exercise hypotension benefits. So, we're going to do legs up a wall pose today for our demonstration. I'm not going to make you guys do it. I'm going to do it, but I'm going to talk about it a bunch. So uh, this is called passive inversion. Uh, the benefits of passive inversion, that's what my beautiful, very nicely done drawings are about over here. <laughs> and the green is supposed to represent the lymphatic system, and the blue is supposed to represent the venous system, or the, the veins that return blood. So uh, an issue that happens with hypertension a lot is that we get edema, sweat, swelling of the ankles, and basically fluid getting trapped in the lower extremities. And if you can imagine, if you're sitting all day, or if you're on your feet all day, then blood and fluid pool down at the bottom of your feet, and at the end of the day, you're, everything's swollen. So this is something we can do that's very accessible to help mitigate that issue. Now, the lymph system doesn't have a pump at all, so there's no pressure. And the venous system has almost no pressure. All of the pressure dissipates in the capillary beds, right? So the arteries full of pressure, 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 pressure. It goes and squishes into all the capillaries. And then that's the end of the pressure. And then it kind of dumps into the venous system and very slowly works its way back up to the heart. And it's full of these what's called semilunar valves. They're just like this. And it's to prevent backflow. So if I'm standing up, my fluid isn't going to backflow this way. It's going to keep going this way. And what happens is that your skeletal muscle squeezes. And when it squeezes, it pushes fluid up, which is one of the main benefits of walking. Just a little uh, throw that in there. Um, but if you're not getting a lot of walking or you're, set, you're seated, you're really going to, you're not going to get the benefit of the muscles pushing the fluid up. And so if we invert, what happens is we get this passive draining through the venous and the lymphatic system. And something you see in a few different morbidities um, is you'll see a darkening of the bottom of the legs. That is called insufficient venous return. So it's very specific to blood and fluid getting trapped in the lower extremities. And so a lot of different people um, benefit from this type of exercise. Okay, so I um, want to talk about safety first. Now, this is a safe exercise. You're not going to get in this position and it's going to cause you problems. The issue is that it dramatically decreases your blood pressure all at one time, right? And so once you're in this position, you don't want to jump back up. So if you're down here, or we'll get there, modifications where you're um, up on a bed or something, and you got your legs up and your phone rings and it's not next to you and you jump up to go get the phone, you could lose consciousness. It's very real. Um, or at least be dizzy enough that you fall and hurt yourself. And I don't want anybody to get hurt. So we're going to do a little demonstration. Um, so just mindful of the lightheadedness and the dizziness associated with legs up a wall pose. And part of the reason is because all of this fluid rushes down and it increases the fluid pressure in your heart. And you've got all these baroreceptors or pressure receptors. And they sense that and they go, whoa! And then they lower your they lower your heart rate in an effort to lower your blood pressure. So, and then the other two things is that you want to make sure you keep a slight bend in the knee. 
there's another picture that's an even better example, but you don't want to hyperextend the knee, and you also want to keep a perpendicular or less line with your legs. You do not want to pull your legs up over the front of your body. That can cause hyperextension in the back, and if you are not very flexible, you're going to want to stick with the modifications. So the basic movement, uh, getting down and getting back up, I'm not going to do it on the floor because it would be visually challenging. And so I'm going to use the table, um, which is actually not tables, but is one of the modifications I'll show you in just a minute. So when you get down, you really want to take your time getting down, right? and you want to come down, oh, I totally put my mic in the way. Okay, I'm going to do this side. Improvise, right? Okay, and so you want to come down really slowly onto your side and come down. Now, coming down is really not going to be as big of a problem as getting back up, but you still want to be in the mindset of going slow. And so I'm down. I want to wait about two minutes. Down there at the bottom it says two, five, two. That's a minimum of two minutes. And what I'm doing is I'm letting the fluid in my body redistribute, right? I'm letting my heart and my brain and my nervous system catch up with what I'm doing. And then I'm going to get into my position slowly in the same way where I come around. Right? You've got a good example up there, so I'm not too worried about that part. And I bring my legs up. And then I want to do it for at least five minutes, right? And then so I lay here for five minutes, and I'm already, I can already feel a little bit of lightheadedness just from doing this right now. And then, okay, I'm done. I'm going to get up. I'm going to roll onto my side, and I'm going to wait for two minutes before I get up. And two minutes may feel like a long time. Okay, okay go ahead and advance the slide. All right, so this is one of my favorite modifications. Um, I'm just going to talk while we do our two minutes so you can see what actually laying here for two minutes sounds like, feels like. This is the chair modification. This is great for people who have an issue getting up and down from the floor, but can still get up and down from the floor. And part of the reason is that the chair is there to help you get down and get back up. You're going to want to use a nice sturdy chair, maybe not one of those floppy folding chairs. And then the other thing is that this position that the legs are in here is very relaxing. You've got negative pressure on the back, negative pressure on the knees, and negative pressure on the ankles. Very good for you, for your joint health. And then you're really comfortable in holding this position. It's great for doing one leg at a time, which is difficult when you have your legs up a wall because you don't have as many options on where to put your other leg. <laughs> so here you've got your other leg just nicely relaxed there and you can do one leg at a time, which can be really beneficial for people with less mobility. All right, go ahead and advance. And this is another one of my favorite modifications, the bed modification. Um, it's a very safe place. If you are worried, it is a safe place for you if you're by yourself and you're like, well, what if I can't get back up off the floor, right? Or what if I can't get on the floor at all, but I can, I can just scoot into my bed and I can do this. Um, it can be accessible for people with mobility issues, um, very comfortable. So the goal is really to relax and do it as long as you feel comfortable. So the higher end, the 15 minutes, you're going to get more benefit out of it. All right, hold on, we got a few seconds left. Okay, all right, that was two minutes. Kind of felt like a long time. I'm going to jump back to what I was doing. I'm going to make sure that I press myself up from my side, I come up slowly, and then I'm seated. I'm going to sit for a few, not, it doesn't have to be two whole minutes, but I'm going to sit for a minute, and then I'm going to get up slowly, right? Safety first. So, okay, back to this. So it's a very comfortable way to do legs up a wall, and if you are just starting out or you don't have that much flexibility in your legs, you can move your bottom away from the wall and have your legs at a little more of an angle. Really the goal is to get as much of a straight line as you can, but also that your, the lowest part of your extremities are above your chest, so that at least some gravity is pulling fluid, pushing fluid down out of your legs. And I think legs up a wall in bed is very convenient because you're already in bed. <laughs> and you could just stay here. 
get your phone. You know, we sit there and play with our phones in bed. Just, just stick your legs up above your chest. That's the goal. Look at your feet and be thankful that you still have them. So the exercise prescription for legs up a wall is three to five days a week, seven is better, uh, zero to three. So laying there, you really shouldn't feel much, much exertion, but if you are doing it without support, without a band or a strap, or I've seen people do it with towels, or you can use anything that holds your feet up, or a chair, you're gonna feel some effort in holding your legs up with your muscles. Uh, five to 15 minutes a day. Evening is best because that's when we've really accumulated the most fluid down in our lower, our feet and our calves and stuff. And then the type of exercise this is, is passive inversion and flexibility. All right, go ahead. All right, so now you've got some nice practical applications for how to use exercise to manage blood pressure. And similarly, we're gonna talk about diet again and do an activity looking at a day of a DASH diet and making some choices. And this is all adapted from the American Heart Association. So if you had to choose between, for breakfast, sausage and cheese croissant breakfast sandwich with hash browns and orange juice, or a veggie breakfast sandwich on a whole wheat English muffin with sweet potato fries and an orange fruit cup, what do you think would be lower in sodium? Yeah, good job. So. Is there anything that stands out on there that is like, oh, that probably has a lot of sodium that made you choose the one on the right? Sausage. Sausage, yeah, so those. Mm -hmm. We have so processed meat, um, cheese on both of them, but for some reason a little less than the one on the right. Uh, the sweet potato fries and the hash browns probably both have salt added to them, but the hash browns are little tiny pieces and the sweet potato fries are a little bigger, so probably don't hold on to as much of the salt. So going on to lunch, if you were to choose between a turkey sandwich with a side salad and cucumber slices, or a turkey sandwich with a side salad and a pickle, what do you think would be lower in sodium? Yeah, so this one seems kind of obvious, but when you see how much of a difference it makes, it's pretty huge. So cucumber that's not pickled versus a cucumber that is pickled makes a huge difference. Um, some other things to watch out for are the processed meat again, the bread, and also that salad dressing, just keeping an eye on that. So lastly, we're at dinner. So would you rather, would you rather, which would you think would have lower sodium? Uh, chicken with homemade macaroni and cheese and frozen green beans, or a chicken with boxed macaroni and cheese and canned green beans? Frozen green beans. Nice, you guys are doing awesome. So. Yes, the chicken with box macaroni and cheese and uh, vegetables in a sauce is much higher than the chicken you make at home with macaroni and cheese you make at home with the just frozen vegetables. Um, so I think that this activity is really good in illustrating how just a few little changes can make a huge difference in the amount of sodium that you're consuming. So with that, do you have any questions? Ooh. Good question. That is a good question. I really like like garlic powder and onion powder or cumin. Mm. Those are probably my favorites. Yeah. So if you have like a client that doesn't really cook a lot at home and they eat a lot of processed stuff and mm -hmm. you can't really get them to not eat like packaged stuff, what's like a better option for them? Mm. That is a really good question. I would say encouraging them to look at labels because I think a lot of people just don't do that and assume that it's just a normal amount of sodium. Um, so definitely like comparing labels when they're buying the processed food and then keeping an eye out if they're like eating out a lot for like condiments um, and processed meat, I would say are the biggest ones to encourage. You can, you can ask at the restaurant to have them prepare it. Oh, yeah, that's a good tip too. Thank you. Yeah. How does resistance training help lower uh, hypertension? I'm glad you asked. Um, <laughs> it's, it's really the same process as with aerobic training, but it's much less. 
So you still get a little bit of that nitric oxide production and the post-exercise hypotension, but it's more gonna be like two or three milligrams of mercury than uh, the upwards of over 10. So that's really the big difference. And so when people, and sometimes, not everybody, some people really like resistance training a lot more than aerobics, right? Cardio, there's all those memes about how terrible cardio is. Um, and so it's like just illustrating that they're gonna get the, a, good, better benefit if they make sure to include that aerobic training as well as resistance training. And then if someone is just really interested in doing cardio and you want to kind of encourage some resistance training, so you, you still get the benefits from it. And then you're going to get these other benefits, which we didn't even touch on today, which is um, the having more skeletal muscle tissue, which is going to increase your metabolism, which is going to change the way you process, you process and integrate the food that you eat, which can help mitigate hypertension as well. Yes? What kind of resistance training would you recommend? Because for hypertension, mm -hmm. uh, for people who have hypertension, mm -hmm. I, uh, I know that you have to avoid upper body That's right. resistance training. Yeah. So well, and the reason to, it's, you don't have to totally avoid upper body. You can do some, you just want to be really moderate with it because it increases heart rate faster. And so if they're already hypertensive, it's going gonna, it's gonna to skyrocket their heart rate faster than doing a lower body. And so what I would focus on is not so much just not doing upper body as much as doing whole body, but doing the high rep, low weight, you know, and then they're getting more of an aerobic uh, benefit from that style of weight training, whereas I would definitely avoid high weight, low rep training because I think that's going to put them at a greater danger of blood pressure spikes and drops and things like losing consciousness. I would add also that when you're doing kind of a lower intensity, higher reps, you're less likely to use the Valsalva maneuver, so like that's holding right. your breath and then your blood pressure skyrockets. So mm -hmm. another benefit of and my favorite spice is paprika. Mm. Nice. And I like to put it on popcorn. <laughs> Anything else? All right, well, that's all we have for you guys today. Thank you so much for coming. We have this table here with a bunch of information on it. There is a really cool handout on hypertension and potassium that goes into greater detail. And so if that was interesting for you, you're welcome to just take one. And um, yeah, we, uh, we could take your blood pressure if you're interested in knowing what it is today. And we're prepared. And that's it. Thank you so much for coming.